Thank you to you students. Uh, thank you to faculties, professors, and to uh, the institution for having me present to you uh, my um, emotional story. Uh, I call it emotional story because it is indeed an emotional story. Uh, these emotional stories that you heard from lost boys and lost girls and people like myself uh, from South Sudan um, are indeed are these stories uh, that we cannot turn our back or deaf ear uh, when we heard people talk about them. Um, I, when I start to speak out about my own experiences, I used to cry. And sometimes I have to um, leave um, before I, I finish talking, and, and that is, it was very hard for me to really go back to everything that had happened to me and everything that I had seen. I don't know how many of you have actually watched this movie, and I'm going to tell you the name of the movie. Have you watched the Otero Wanda movie? For those who haven't watched it, should watch it. I'm not recommending it's a good thing that will amuse you or entertaining you, but it will give you another perspective and maybe a little bit connect the dots of what I'm telling you tonight. I was in the same movie, not in Rwanda though. Rwanda is in Africa. Um, I, I really uh, felt sorry when I learned about that when I came to this country. I, I never knew even when I was in Africa because I was struggling my own way for my own survival. And it is just God is miracle, um, and you forgive me, I'm actually very, I'm not very religious, but I am someone believing in God. God indeed has the one that saved me and delivered me from the uh, uh, bondage, because I was held there for 10 long years, full decade. Of, I never had anyone to love with me or anyone to love me. Um, this is not the way I wanted to start my story, but I just wanted to continue to recognize this, all those who have made this evening possible for me and for you as well to be here. And even those who did not make it here, I'm now, you will go and you will leave here as an ambassador because you are here for the purpose to learn, but not just to learn and, and make it actually none of your business. I believe you came here because it is your business too to do what it takes, because we all have what it takes to make a difference. We don't have to have lots of money, or we don't have to have, or we don't have to be a great speakers in order to make a difference. Uh, we can just make a difference in the way, I just met with a young group of uh, high school, I believe, uh, who happened to tell me they have read my book. I think it's you here, I can't remember all your name, but I appreciate your presence here, and I appreciate for sharing with me how you have enjoyed reading my book. It is very hard sometimes to interpret it, would enjoy. But I know not in the way that you, some other people may think simply, but it is very compelling in the book that can amuse you. Yes, indeed, there's a part of the story that will entertain you, amuse you uh, with culture chalking when I first came to America and have to adjust, struggling with the food and the weather in Fargo, North Dakota, which is my first home. Um, you heard movie Fargo, I don't know how it looked like. I, somebody, been, people have been asking me about that movie over time, but i never seen it. Um, but that was my first home when I came late of 1999. So indeed the book is very compelling. Indeed the book is also uh, very hard to um, believe. And when you believe, you, you feel guilty. You feel, why not me doing something like to help others? Because as we sit here this evening, uh, in freedom and comfort, there are millions around the world. I work with these modern-day abolitionist groups um, called American Anti-Slavery Group or Anti-Slavery Group, and uh, they have done incredibly well uh, with uh, raising awareness about modern-day slavery, not just in Africa, um, and talking about slavery, even the human trafficking and smuggling of those who get tricked by the businessmen and businesswomen from the poor countries to leave their uh, little properties that they have and come here with a promise to work for no pay under threat of violence. And that is actually a term that could be um, considered as a slavery because these people um, happen to be treated that way and taking away their documents and scaring them not to speak. Otherwise, they will be, uh, their parents or family member will be killed or they will be killed or be handed to the police, all these kind of things that uh, 
um, but, but anyway, that's not, uh, I think our U.S. State Department and the CIA know this very well about human trafficking uh, in this country. But I had to tell you, the American Institute have done incredible work. Um, and if you read The Disposable People by Kevin Bells, that book has estimated how many, 27 million or 30 something millions our human brothers and sisters are still held in bondage today. Uh, when I actually heard of that, even though I'm not good in math, I think 27 million to 30 million is actually a huge number. And, and I know when you talk about slavery, I know exactly how it feels like when, because I had lived it. Most of you may, because a lot of people in this country believe believes that slavery actually ended or had been abolished it uh, since um, maybe 200 years ago, 19, 1865, I believe, based on American history. Um, the slavery in this country might have been abolished at that time, but yet slavery is not history. It is still happening, and I just talked to you about human trafficking. Uh, I just talked to you, it is happening, it is legal in the country where I originally come from, Sudan. Uh, it is being practiced as no law for to punish somebody or, or bring the person to justice. Um, so 27 million people that are still held in bondage are the one that actually I represented. And even this evening, I'm standing here on their behalf. I know for 10 years, I used to lie awake and wonder who will come and free me. Nobody. But God did, though. God delivered me, saved me for that long period of time, and delivered me at the end. So today, there are millions and hundreds of thousands in my own country that are still alive awake at night and wonder who will come and feed them. And I think you and I could go and help them. We don't have to go there. It would be very difficult, difficult and nightmare to make it to where these slaves are. But we can do something simple like what I'm doing here. You could speak out about it. You could educate others who believe slavery is not um, is, is, is something that in the past. You can actually write a letter to your congressman, congresswoman. You could talk to your religious groups, uh, you know, pastor or rabbi or others. You could actually call the White House. Um, you could ask these people because they have power. But first, what it takes is education. If you are not aware of something, you can never actually affect the change. So you have to start doing that right away. You have to tell them it is happening. It is happening in this country. It is happening in that country. It is happening even in our own country here. What are we doing? This is the question that you could do, and I think some of you, and this is what the, uh, the Human um, Network um, Club or organization here had started doing, and that's why I'm here. This is a part of the awareness. And we can extend that to another nearby college or the community um, center. Um, and it will be that way we can actually bring an end and abolish and eradicate slavery once and for all for our young brothers and sisters to able to also pursue their dreams. Um, I have a dream too. You know, for 10 years that I was working, I, I never enjoyed my childhood because um, I, I was taken away at age of seven. And this is where I want to begin. For those who have not read my book yet, uh, Skip from Slavery, the true story of my 10 years in captivity and my journey to freedom in America. I want to begin by telling you how I became slave. I remember. One of the beautiful evening, like just today, this beautiful spring weather. And I was just underneath, uh, playing underneath our big mango tree. We have several big mango tree close to our home. And one of the biggest one is where the kid from the neighbor and the close friends of mine come every single morning and, you know, sat down there and just compete uh, with what we call future, and that is we ask our big brothers to bring us mud. Um, and we compete by shaping cows out of mud. Um, and it is something silly sound to you, but it is a competition to determine who will one day become a rich 
uh, person by cattle. Uh, because we are the cattle people. We like cows, like those in Texas. <laughs> we like cowboys, yeah. You see our president, Salfa Kier, he wear a cowboy hat. It was given to him by uh, our brother and our euro. I call our brother and the euro, uh, the former president of the United States, Mr. Bush. I have met him three times. He was so kind. Um, I, you can disagree with me politically. I'm too. And don't, take, don't mistake me, I'm too American. I'm, I'm, I'm also a dual citizen of this country. And I stand for what American people stand for. So whatever that he might have done wrong it might have affected me too. Uh, but I had to tell you, he's the man that broken the silence of the whole world, not just USA. He's the one that brought the peace in my country. I will talk more detail about that. You could ask me in case I forget. You can ask me when I turn to you for questions. Um, so so I, I, I remember on that evening, while we're competing, shaving cows out of mud, um, my mother came to me, her name Adut, A-D-U-T. Um, she, she's a lovely lady and she always smiled to me and I never said no to her whatsoever. Everything that she always asked me, I do it. But that evening she said, Piol, Piol is my African name, P-I-O-L, and also my Christian names. We earn two names because we are Christians and then they insist to give you African name. Even though people don't call you with it, your parents have flexibly calling you whatever name they want anytime. But um, she asked me, Piol, can you please go to local market to sell cooked eggs and peanuts? And I immediately said no, because the competition was very high at that day. Very, very high. Uh, and I'm someone that always like to compete, and I compete on the top. I, I always want, if you have me your basketball team, I'm not good though, for those who play basketball, I, I'm not good. Uh, but I'm someone that always compete all the way, I never give up. I never say it's too this or too that, I, I don't know how to say it's too difficult or it cannot be achieved. I believe no situation is permanent, right? Everything's subject to change. So it is human who makes computers faster than us think, but we're the one that programming it. Um, so. In that case, um, I told my mother no, and she didn't say anything. She walked towards close to me, and she said, did you say no? And I immediately withdraw, and I said, no, I said yes. <laughs> so uh, I remember, I remembered, I left, I told my friends, I waved to them, including my two siblings, two sisters, um, and they hugged me, and my mother, and I went, we were escorted by a girl with about 15 years old, her name Nibol. If you ask me where is Nibol today, I wouldn't tell you, I don't even know. Whether she's actually alive or killed, whatever happens, I, I don't know. But that day, we took a trip to a local market in Nyumlel. The marketplace is called Nyumlel, and the soon we arrived there, we sat underneath a big tree. There were many people from all different villages who come there to sell and buy. Unfortunately, by that sudden, we heard a lot of gun shootings. Gunshots were coming towards our village and smoke, and people were pointing towards that village. And as a kid sometime, it's like when you're sitting there, your parents are talking about something important, unless they tell you, we need your attention, you need to listen to this, you will say, it's adult talk, I don't, I don't have to care for it. I heard people talking about the gunshot, and I heard people talking about the smoke pointing towards my village, but I didn't actually knew how serious um, it was uh, in my village that my parents were actually burned alive. Uh, my two sisters, my mother, and the, everybody in the entire village, they collect the people and put them in big heart like this auditorium and they burned them alive. Um, who done that was the Arabs, Bagara, or now called Arab ginger wheat. Uh, if you heard the story of Darfur, the ongoing conflict in Darfur, or the killing, um, or genocide, I don't know what term the State Department uses now, but I think it should be called genocide because if thousand people died a week, I don't know how you can call that. 
I don't know what justification you could give to rename it or call it or whatever way. But again, it is not the first genocide, though, in my country. So it wouldn't surprise anybody, and it wouldn't even um, uh, make people who haven't acted um, during the over two millions that killed in southern Sudan alone, my people, including my parents that I just mentioned to you, nobody ever talked about us. Uh, no video we ever see about our people, how they struggle. Uh, but this could be also um, made to movie like Water Rwanda, but nobody, nobody filmed it. So that day, that big smoke was my parents um, being burned alive, and uh, people in the village and the same militia men um, who burned down and kill and kidnap women and children. Uh, and I would be careful here when I say women is not randomly ever kind. I don't know how you're differentiating, but they actually take the physical one, the one that's still young, and the old women, they abandon them or kill them. It is very hard even today when you go to South Sudan, you see a lot of elderly women have no spouse, they have no kids. Uh, the children either been becoming a lost boys that you heard about 3,500 of them came to USA, or um, being killed or kidnapped and taken to slavery and husband being killed because they don't allow these physical men, um, they kill them. And they only take younger children so that they could be easily convert um, to Islam and easy uh, brainwash and, and, and rename them and using them to do all domestic and other things uh, like what I used to do. Um, so. This militia man came to our marketplace, uh, and suddenly, after I heard people talking, they surrounded the marketplace, La Wakbar. And they were just rushing and killing people randomly. And this is exactly where I told you to watch that Oterawanda movie. It is just like that when, they, when these people come in. Uh, some were using the source, um, killing. Uh, they don't want to waste the bullet. Uh, some were shooting. and. And I couldn't describe that moment. I was horrified. Um, um, I couldn't believe my eye, and I couldn't believe my ear, and I couldn't believe the event, the scene. But it was true, and it was true that I was even taken as a part of the kids, the children that had been captured. Um, because that was my first, the first time ever in my life to witness a dead body. I'd never seen that body. And I saw many people being killed, men and women, children. They were shooting randomly until when everyone was scared and they just, they couldn't do anything. They were powerless. People were shouting for help and seeking for exit, no exit, nowhere to go, and nobody to help. So they just start selecting who they want to take um, and, and who they want to kill and abandon. Um, so that what happened at the Nyumlal market, and I became slave that evening. We were actually marched to the north, um, and I was given to the man uh, named Juma Abdullah, who became my master for the next 10 years. And um, Juma, uh, I remember when I first arrived um, at his farm, he called the old family, like when you buy a new vehicle or a home or whatever it is, and you want to call a family members or a neighbors to come and uh, celebrate with you. But a celebration was celebrated in a very different culture, a very different um, manner or way. Um, I would just um, met to sit far away, and the kid was sent towards me with the stick to beat me um, and peeing on me, some spitting on me, and I see a grandmother and and, and, and the mother and some of the family members were so happy and laughing and everyone was saying a beat, a beat, and I didn't even know what a beat means. I have no idea what they were thinking, uh, what the song was mean, but a beat means black slave. That was my welcome. Uh, you can tell I was seven years old. What is my guilt? Why would these people treating me in a, such a way? Um, and. Uh, I, I remained there for 10 years. 
I was immediately trained to take care of the goats. I wasn't surprised this gentleman, Juma, has a lot of kettles uh, because my father, um, in the community, people call him Ajak in my native language. Ajak means rich man. He has a lot of cattle, and he's a, a big, big farmer, um, and he does business too. Um, so, but I was surprised and shocked how they forced me to take care of a couple hundreds of goats by myself. Goats that look alike sometimes, they have this almost the same color. When one goat is missing, they threaten me to shop up one of my finger, and they beat me uh, severely every time um, because some sick goats or some lazy goat or whatever reason that one or two um, sometime um, miss when, we, when I return them home, I always beat them. These people never ask me, uh, how are you today? Um, what kind of food I should eat? None of that, but they always make sure. Is the all goats are here? I don't even, I can't even count those many goats. But they know them, they know which one is missing. And that's what I already learned, um, that these people are, I'm in the wrong place, the wrong people. Uh, these are the wrong human beings. They have different ideology. I think they believe they're better off than I, and better off than my people. Um, I was always, you know, wanted to ask questions, and particularly three questions. And I did ask this three question after seven years, seven years long, because I, I was brought there, and I only speak my native language, Dinka. I don't speak Arabic. But I had to learn in a very hard way um, when, when I was there, because when they speak to me in Arabic, I have to remember. Uh, memorization is one of the, what helped me. Um, to really able to speak the language. Even though I was actually converted, I have to perform Islamic prayer, and I'm a Christian. I was beaten when I refused. I accepted, but not from my heart. Not from my heart. I was still Christian, but to survive. Because it is by gun, gunpoint, and you have no option. Either do it, or you will be killed. So I think it's very hard when somebody, these are the tough decisions where you have to make tough decisions as my friend um, or friend. Uh, and my year, well, George W. Bush used to say, when you actually, um, in a tough situation, you have to make a tough decisions. And I made that. I, I wasn't happy to make that, but I have. But again, um, it is in long details. For those who have read my book, I think you follow me very well and you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I encourage you for more details because um, I don't want to dominate the evening uh, for all that. I encourage you as well to Google me or whatever that is. Uh, you can learn a little bit about me. Um, but let me just um, finish it that I, I asked three questions in uh, seven months, seven years after I learned broken Arabic. And one of the first questions I asked when I learned the word abit mean black slave. Um, I asked my master, Juma, when he brought me my food. Uh, he's the only one that bring my food. He put it away like that. When you, you don't treat your dogs like that. Your pet, no, this is amazing. There's a pet store, there's everything. But you, the way you treat them here, it is, is beyond the way even they treat human being, the way I was treated as a human being. So uh, Juma, when his wife cooked my food, uh, she would put it away. I have one plate, the same plate that I eat on. Uh, she would give it to her husband, her husband put it away, would call my name and leave and I would come and go get it. The same not done, I would have to watch it and then I would bring it and put it in the same place. I can't have eye contact with his wife um, I can't come close to her, and if by mistake, by accident, you call it, I have eye contact, she would tell me, don't move my head. She will come and spit at my face or send one her son to come and pee on me or anything. She always threaten me. She always tell me, don't look at me. If she's coming by that direction, I have to look opposite, or she would tell me, bend my head down and don't look. So. And I always say, what is such a horrible woman? Why she hated me and she had children? But again, 
Uh, she's not alone. There are bad people too. And, and this actually um, gives you and I um, another way to think about us as humans. Among any society, of course, and in particular that society I'm talking about, there are bad people and good people. Maybe good people are people like uh, Abdurrahman, the man who finally helped me when I escaped, the man who hired me in his lorry or a truck and actually made me stay with him for two months and his family, asking his wife to treat me like one of the family member and paying for my uh, uh, truck ticket uh, to the capital of Sudan, Khartoum, when I finally escaped in 1996. It seemed long ago, but it's just not too long ago, my friends. In 1996, if you invited me, I would have come here to Gordon and speak to you. I was still struggling. I was still in slavery. Maybe that the year, the most wanted man was in my country, planting what it is now and become a result of 9-11 and all the other things that are happening. Hussam bin Laden was in my country for six years. He left in the year of 1996. Um, and that's why, you know, my people um, decided, and I was surprised if it was ever hurt. I was surprised in a moment that uh, we, we have just met it like Jewish people. And remember when the Jews were slaves in Egypt? We just made it. The sea just opened for us. And we are praying, praying and praying, and asking the international community. And again, when we say the international community, we mean USA, USA. USA is the leading. So for our brothers in Darfur and sisters in Darfur and Southern Blue Nile, and Nuba Mountains, and Abye, and many other, including in Beja. Um, so they will make it too, and we will be with them in solidarity, the people of South Sudan. So I escaped finally in 1996 um, uh, after I asked the three question that was not answered, but were answered by beating, a severe beating, and I almost killed, because I asked my master why they called me a beat, black slave and why they forced me to sleep with the animals, and why nobody loves me. I think these are very sincere questions, but instead he grabbed the biggest stick. He has favorite stick that he beat me with. He beat me, he said, never, never again, ever again, ask me these questions. So I was taught uh, during 10 years in captivity to say yes, only yes. Um, even when it's a big no, I have to say yes for everything. So that's when I knew that it wouldn't matter how long and how hard I work for these people. My job was already rewarded, not in a good way. They should appreciate me, you're a good worker. You know, when you have a coworker or anybody working for you, and you, I don't know how, when you grade somebody to the next level, it is because he or she doing well. But if you, already, if you can know that from your heart and not appreciating and recognizing and, and saying that to that person, I was treated just, I don't know what I can describe, but I was totally dehumanized. I was just somebody doing something that I had to do because to survive, for only survival, um, and, and making another man happy and enjoying his wealth and everything. But he never recognizes what I have done for so long. For 10 years, I worked for a job that I had never paid for. And that's what made when I first came here, I was only having one day off from work. And that is Sunday. I said, I have to go to church. And after church, I would do my laundry and other things, maybe visit people um, that I don't get to see. I was working 16 hours a day, six days a week when I was in Iowa. I was working at a meat company. I was working at the... Uh, hotel, all the day in. I never get tired. I said for 10 years I was working for no pay. This is the job that I don't, here in this country, they time you. Eight hours, you will go over, they pay you. And you know exactly what you get paid in each hour and how much you will get in end of the week or two weeks or a month. 
but the job that I was doing, I have no limit. I don't know when. I was the first one to work up in the morning and the last one to go to bed. That was my life routine. When I, this is a job that never being recognized or appreciated. So um, again, um, I was so lucky after multiple attempts to make my final skip and I made my way to the capital of Sudan, Khartoum, and eventually was helped by the South Sudanese uh, businessmen at, low, at the refugee camps and made my way to Egypt by land. I didn't fly. Um, so I, I, I took a train for two or three days, I remember, to Sudan and Egypt border, the place called Aswan. Uh, excuse me, not Aswan, Aswan is Egypt, um, uh, Alpha. And from Alpha, I took a boat. Uh, you see Red Sea, I'm a train, I, I torch Red Sea. Uh, a train was, I mean, the boat was three days or something. Uh, and we arrived in Aswan. From Aswan, I stuck for a few days. I didn't have money uh, to take the next train to Cairo. And I was just going anyway. I don't even know where I'm going to and who I'm going to stay with. Um, I, have no, I have money for day one, and I finished them day one. I, um, I add them day one, I buy food, and I finish. So I've been eating from other people just invited me to eat with them. When I stuck in Aswan, somebody paid for my train ticket to Cairo. I remember when I first arrived in Cairo at the busiest, busiest city, um, the Tahrir Square, everybody know what the Tahrir Square now from the recent revolution. <laughs> um, I was in Ramses. Ramses is the next town, the busiest, because um, Tahrir Square is the heart of the city. And then the train um, is like when you say um, Union Station somewhere in uh, DC or either. This is where the train. So I got off the train and I just sat down. I didn't know where to go. I speak Arabic better than my English even today. But Egyptians have different accents. Um, and I was sitting there, I have no bag, I have nothing, and they thought me I was a street boy. Nobody cares for me. I spent the entire day. I was thirsty, I was hungry. I was so exhausted because I've been traveling the entire two weeks. Until one of the Egyptian guy, who's a taxi driver, um, around 6 p.m. something, came to me and said, and Samara, what do you do in Samara? That's how they call uh, black people. Um, and I said, um, I'm just sitting, I don't know where to go. He said, there's Samara, like you, who come from, are you from Sudan? I said, yes. He said, they, when they come, we all will take them to the, to the church, the churches in Abbasia. I said, would you please take me there? Um, he told me some, something, um, 17 Egyptian pounds. I said, I have not even one pound. So he left. And then asked me again, 16, I said, I don't even have, if I have, I will give you all that. I don't even know where, where that place is, how far it is. I wouldn't pay you anything, but I don't have it. So he was very kind. So he came and said, come, get on. He took me, he was a truck driver. He dropped me off in the front of the church called uh, Sekakini at the Catholic Church in Abbasia, uh, Cairo. And when I went in, there was many, many people, including some people that I knew actually on the train who knew the way they were welcome and taken there. I would receive because the, the church authority sees people that are new. I was brought in, I was given two blankets, one to cover myself and one to lay on. And, uh, and, and everyone, people stayed there as, as long as, you know, we have nowhere to go. They make you stay there. What they do, they ask you your name, your village, your chief back in Sudan, and they hung your name on the board. So anybody that know you, relate to you from your area, that will say, I will invite you and come stay with me. It's where you only leave that church. Otherwise, you will be transferred between churches. I spent 22 days until somebody who used to be actually um, a leader um, in my state, um, and he was living in a two-bedroom apartment in the same area with 13 children plus his wife and himself. 15 people invited me. His name is Tim. He's actually a minister now within our government in the South, but he, he was in Washington, D.C., in Virginia, I should say. He was in Fairfax, Virginia. So he invited me to stay with him. 
And, and that's when they took me to the United Nations office in, um, uh, in Mandesin, in Cairo, Cairo. I was interviewed, and I was actually asked to be re-interviewed again another year later by the INS from this country. This is, is a long, long process. You have to be patient. You have, and you have to tell exactly the same story that you told last time. And of course, it was my story. I could never forget it. So I came back, I, and I retold this story, and I was granted an opportunity to come to this country late of 1999 as a refugee. And this is where I told you I start, um, you know, the part that, that you may uh, a little bit get amused by the culture. Um, I stuck with three weeks in my apartment. Um, I, I couldn't go anywhere. I don't speak English, don't even know anything. Didn't know anybody, Fargo, North Dakota, was, even today, is still different to me. I, I go there to visit and I laughed. I said, this is completely different country now. But now you have people, I was there and everywhere I go, and I never ride actually bicycle. So I was given a bicycle by the Luton Social Services. So I ride that bicycle in the winter and everyone laugh at me. People want to take picture and I didn't even know how dangerous it was because I don't know. I was so eager to learn how to ride the bicycle. There's a sun mud. Sun mud is like a supermarket stop and shop or shops, you call it. So I go there to buy some cookies and fruits. Um, and almost every day shopping come and want to take a picture of me and looking at me, staring at me. I never really care. I said, these people don't know. I, I'm, I'm too doing the same thing. I'm looking at them. They're looking at me. And it's just it's funny. But this is, this is uh, and I felt lonely. I, I said, I'm very happy I have my own place, but I'm alone. I, I wanted to be with, uh, with the people that I communicate with. Uh, so I went back to uh, Luton Social Services office where the organization actually, or agency that sponsored me. And I appreciated my sponsor, Barry Nelson, um, uh, because they have interpreted someone who speak Arabic from Iraq, was working, Ahmed. Um, there was a Somalian guy, but he only knows Islam Alec, but he doesn't speak Arabic. So he was actually um, substituted with someone that speak Arabic, real Arabic, because that Iraqi guy was the one that able to talk with me and other, um, somebody from other Arabic country who speak Arabic like me. So I was actually then sent to Iowa because there's a lot of Sudanese in Iowa and the weather adjustment didn't change. It was just only the same thing. I was in Amos, and there was a lot of snow and cold weather, but it was very good because I was able to stay with the people that I knew back in Egypt when I was a refugee there and got a job in Nevada, Iowa, two jobs, um, until when I was actually um, asked by this modern-day abolitionist group that I still work with today, American and Savior Group, I was able to move to Boston in May of 2000 until the present time. And I have enjoyed this country. And I enjoyed this city, Boston, Massachusetts, because I have learned when I went to evening high school in this country for only one year at the Boston Evening Academy between BU campuses in Commonwealth Avenue, um, I have learned that America was liberated mostly by the leaders of this city. So indeed, Boston is actually a centralism of abolitionism. So I appreciated becoming a young abolitionist in this country, in this city, and working with the abolitionist group. So you actually empowered me. You actually empowered me, empowered what I am doing today. Um, you made me to becoming a leader and wanting to become a leader to help my people and to contribute to something this great society. Um, I started this junior year, and I think it will end. I don't know when I will stop doing this. Uh, my people have just gained it. Um, our independent from the people that have so long suppressed and oppressed and marginalized us. My people have been marginalized by the Northern Sudanese after we gained it, our independent from the original colony, uh, British, since 1956. This is the time British left our country. Of course, we have to, we are left actually under the Northern Sudanese Islamist and fundamentalist, uh, fundamentalist regime, um, uh, Islamic rules, uh, Sharia, it was in, 
imposing on us everything that was Arab culture and language, of course, we were recolonized by them because the power were actually handed, uh, handed to them by the British. So we've been fighting for all this long. We fought two long civil wars, one starting from um, uh, 1955 to 1972 uh, until the Addis Ababa uh, peace accord was signed. That peace was broken 10 years later. 1983, we fought the war until 2005 with the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in Avarja, Kenya, uh, which granted the people of South Sudan um, to uh, determine the fate through uh, the process of uh, referendum. It was held in this uh, year, in January, where we actually voted overwhelmingly. 98.90, uh, what? Eight something percent is amazing. Is we should have made a hundred percent, but of course we missed the few digits. But it was um, it was actually something that awaited for a long, long time. Um, it's something that we sacrificed much, much. I told you my parents are among these my ties. This Euro and Yearns who have actually sacrificed their life, including our uh, late Dr. John Grang who went to school after he finished his school PhD at Iowa State University, went and joined the movement and became the head of the movement, died just three weeks after the Comprehensive Peace Agreement was signed. Um, in 2005, he was killed or crushed and or died on the helicopter crash after he visited his uh, long friend and colleague in high school, uh, the current president of Uganda, Museveni, uh, and he was killed on his way going back home. Um, but he, he did not die in vain though, we just gained it, we just gained our independence. Even though there are many obstacles, many problems still, including the post-referendum um, uh, issues uh, and also pending um, uh, public consultation for the people of Blue Nile and Nuba Mountain and the issue of BA. Uh, BA, we're supposed to have not referendum but referenda. The people of BA, uh, the Nai Ngog Dinka was my tribe, the largest tribe in the entire country of Sudan. Um, they've been claimed by the Northern Sudanese uh, fundamentalist regime that are part of the North. They're claiming their region to be a part of the North when they are typically not. They don't look like them, they don't speak like them, they don't, nothing to connect them. They're absolutely different. But because the unity that they embrace always is the unity of resources, because that is the oil rich. That's where the oil is, actually. And uh, they want to claim that part to be theirs. So they, they threaten that if the people, if the nine of Dinka exercise their right, they will provoke war. So we didn't want to go back because we all know how war is. Um, and nothing can be ever solved by violence. So our military said, no, they're, prov they're trying to provoke that. They bombed, they did everything, including my own county, three times during a referendum. Nobody ever responded militarily. Go would say, that's okay, you kill 100, 200. You kill already over two millions. That's okay. Um, so these are the issues that we have to regroup ourselves and go back to a table of negotiation um, to bring about the lasting peace but the people of South Sudan had made it through the referend uh, January referendum where they have voted overwhelmingly, as I told you, 98 point something. And we are going to be recognized. The dictator president, Omar Hassan Ahmed al-Bashir, who came to that power by military coups in 1989, had abide and will abide with the outcomes. Um, and he will be the first to recognize the new nation, uh, Republic of South Sudan, coming um, July 9, uh, 2011 this year. And of course, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That will be followed by USA, followed by other nations who will recognize us as the world's newest nation. Of course, we will be absolutely added into the world new world um, continents, you know. We will be number 
193rd in the country of the world, and we will be one, um, number 54th in the continent of Africa. We will definitely fall into uh, East Africa, and uh, it is so, uh, it is a great joy. Uh, you have no idea. I, I share with you briefly, if you watch that Ten Commandments by the Jews, it was actually incredible. It, is, it was incredible. Freedom is not something easy. It takes a lot. Take sacrifice, and we are doing it. We just did it, and I'm now you're very proud of us, and we are very proud of you because this independent, including the CPA, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, did not come because of us, the Sudanese alone, and because of the, the long civil wars that we fought. But it is a legacy of the people of the United States. Being students, a teacher, a professor, a community organizer, anybody, it is through you, American people, it is through the international community, but particularly it is the U.S. legacy. It is a legacy of the U.S. government. It is you who have actually pressured those two leaders, the South and the North leaders, to sit down and solve this problem in a peaceful manner. That's why we have reached that milestone. So we appreciate it and we thank you. And we ask you to continue praying and to continue doing what you have been doing before. Um, and now we are in the midst of so much happening in the Middle East and everywhere. But don't forget about us. Don't forget the people of Darfur, the people of Abia, the people of Southern Blue Nile and Nuba Mountain, particularly those in Nuba Mountain and Southern Blue Nile were supposed to have what is called a public, uh, a popular cons uh, consultation. The bill that granted them to sit their own um, parliamentary, to sit and decide with their own people whether they want to be a part of the South or North, that thing is not happening. The Khartoum is still not paying attention to this. They are even worrying now about the, what the young intellectuals may do uh, demonstrating um, Bashir been saying, I watched satellite TV, said, anybody want to do or want to say anything, we will kill you. Uh, it is an open threat that been made, and I think the young people say, we don't want to see what's happening in Syria and other places. But ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing uh, joyful um, than just talking to you about these um, matters. But what is next, I think the new nation is like a new baby. A new baby must be watched by everybody. Um, and, and we want you to really be there for us. That new nation, there's nothing is to be reconstructed. Um, we are studying um, the construction from the scratch, from the zero, nothing. South Sudan, if I have a map of the south and the north and click on the north, you will see the north like New York City or somewhere in downtown Boston or Chicago. And then when you go to south, you will definitely see nothing. Only the trees and absolute nothing. When I say nothing, nothing. So you could already by yourself interpret it. This, are not, this is not one country, but two countries. And that's why we say we deserve to be separated. So we can go and struggle in our own way. Now it's up to you. We have helped us to this stage. And it's up to you to also help us to, um, to be with modern, uh, modern uh, nations. Uh, we want to also be, uh, yes, we will be the poorest uh, nation. Um, but we, we, you can help us. So we need you. And expertise that you can bring to my country and help my people will be absolutely welcome. If you are investors, you can come. Um, you, if you are engineer, anything, anything that you have a teacher, we need you. Um, I just wanted to end it. I, I went over. I exhausted everything. And I apologize to my host. Um, but, but this is a very important, significantly important. Um, I had founded my own foundation, the Francis Bach Foundation, um, about a year or so ago. And, and that is to help. Um, I read one of the books book that inspired me. Uh, this is an American um, young man that have a wonderful life and education and everything and money as well. Um, um, the, uh, the Three Cup of Teeth uh, book. Uh, some of you might have seen that book. And that book, when I read about it, for this gentleman who started 
uh, building one school in Afghanistan for the girls and has went on and on and on and feel over 50s and he's going. Um, I, I, I was challenged when I first went back to my village. I, I looked like a foreigner in that country. I can't imagine. I was born there. I couldn't even recognize my own village. I couldn't even uh, comprehend the life of the people there. Where parents, or mother in particular, have to make ask the five years old when she or he should eat the meal that, because they have one meal a day. Um, so you decide you want to eat it now in the morning or you want to eat it in the evening when you go to bed. That is very tough. Uh, and not only that woman, one, one house or two or three or ten. I've been to many, every different village in a different county, in a different state, in ten states in South Sudan. I have seen the same problem. So it is very tough. Uh, education, nothing. No education. I don't think we can do anything without education. If not education, you would have heard my story. You would have never heard and learned anything about me. I struggled very hard when I started to speak out here. I learned my language first, you know. Um, and by the way, if you have an opportunity to tutor me, <laughs> I want to learn English. If you have an opportunity um, to recommend me anywhere at college, to go to college, I want to go to college. I would love to sit with you tomorrow in one of the lecture rooms here. Even though I may not compete high like you will do, I would love to educate myself. Um, I'm 32 years old, and I believe, I believe, I have hope. I believe that I don't even have one degree yet, so I'm not actually educated. But I believe that one day I will have not just one degree, but many. And you could help me with that. So um, if you can actually recommend me to this college, I would appreciate it, or anywhere else. I may, I may not be a good, uh, but uh, again, it is, it is that education um, um, actually enhance a lot of things. Education is the ticket to success. So when I went to my village, even the kids who struggled in their own ways, and let me tell you one story of the girl who was actually 15. She was in seventh grade, and that's the highest level in my village because they have school under the trees in my village in Gorion and that school ran until the seventh grade they stopped because the teachers who are teaching there only studied um, some finished eighth grade, seventh and eighth grade and ninth grade, those who were lucky. And then there's no secondary school to continue on. So this kid, this girl said to me, her name, oh, she said, Francis, you don't know how much I struggle for all the years I've been going to school with my parents. I've been beaten, I've been, I got beaten by everybody in my family. Um, they always threatened me, want to kill me. And now I'm finishing school because this is what I promised them. I'm going to be actually um, um, forced for early marriage because this is, you heard about early marriage and uh, it is happening, um, and if you can't kill, these young girls get killed, either by their own parents or anything, any husbands or brothers, because it's, there's a dowry that you, they give to parents, cows. So it's like you're selling your own daughter. It is, poor people does all the bad thing always. But this is culturally something that, is, this is one of the negative thing in my own culture that I don't value. Um, that you can completely forget the human being value by contrasting or comparing it to what you will get, physical object or whatever that is. That not true. So this girl here, and I didn't want to question because uh, I don't want to get into trouble. She might have already been forced into her early marriage because there's no school she can go to. She would have, and nobody have family actually ever educated or value education, so they don't want she struggled. She said that she get her notebooks, books, everything, support from the teachers, but not from her parents. Her parents have goat, they have cows, but they never want to sacrifice even a goat to buy her something a clothes because it is something useless. So that's why I wanted to actually educate the communities. I want to begin with my community, as always said, charity begin at home. I want to start it over there. And I have already started. Um, I have no 
much money raised, but my foundation seemed to be doing very well. Um, and I was trying to break the record uh, this year um, to start building high school in my village. But very unfortunate, we haven't reached what we needed, um, at least something that to begin with. But I'm very hopeful and very hopeful that people like you and others will be able to support me. So if you go to the francisbockfoundation.org, you will see the progress. You'll see some of the pictures and video clips when I go back. But I would have done this without anybody that helped me. My American father, my hero, is the number one hero. His name and what he have done and legacy will definitely go down with the history of our own country, new country. And they will go down as well with the school that I'm building in my village. That person is, it is my dear friend, I call him friend because he's someone who never liked me, even when I traveled with him, never liked me to carry anything from him or do anything for him. He's 60 something years old, he's actually going to 70 years old. He's an amazing man, very energetic and smart. That is Dr. Charles Jacobs. Charles Jacobs has nothing to do with me. He's an American. He's an American. He's a Jewish from New Jersey, Jewish American, wonderful family. He's a business, very successful businessman. He read one of the articles in New York Times or somewhere in magazine in 1993, article that which actually inspired him and made him to become the spokesperson for the people of South Sudan and the people of Sudan, all the marginalized people, and the actually 27 million people. That's what he started, where he started, according to him. He said he read article, you can buy slave back for 35 US dollars in Sudan. 35 US dollars. I don't think you could bring yourself and your peer or a friend to inexpensive restaurant and feed you. I don't think so. You could do that maybe in McDonald's or BK or whatever. But human being, you can buy that person back for 35 US dollars. So he said he wrote an article on the New York Times and thought he was done with his job. Unfortunately, nobody paid attention. Nobody wanted to pick up what he started it. So he stick with it. He stick with it. That's where he found it. The American anti slavery group, he had done incredibly well. I had testified to the Senate. I was actually, my testimony was broadcast live on C-SPAN was brought uh, to tear one of the uh, successful musician for young folks, you may know this guy, Jin's Addiction, uh, Perry, Perry Farrell. He is rock and roll, a uh, very successful person, and he was doing big concert with thousands and thousands of young folks in DC, and was watching a cis band. He saw me when I testified in 2000. In the hearing, the chairman was the late senator from uh, North Carolina, Jesse Hams. Uh, I brought him to tears. Uh, I was there, I shook hands with him, and I said that you have strong arm and a strong voice. Um, and you, all the senators, do have, and the government of these people, of, of this country, and the people of this country, and you have turned your back on us in a deaf year. But I'm here to tell you what happened to me. And I'm here to tell you just Francis Bach, uh, Francis Bach story, but there are millions of people around the world, and hundreds of thousands in my country that cannot be here, even if you invited them to come here today. That's when I brought them to tears. So this gentleman contacted the organization and brought me to LA, where I spent six days in this celebrity house, in Beverly Hill, you'd call it, not Beverly Hill here, but there. Um, um, in, in Los Angeles, where I traveled with him and made me to appear in front of 50,000 um, fans of his music in Palm Springs, California, and 35,000 at San Barbara in California. Um, it was through Charles Jacobs. I actually had that opportunity. And my good friend, uh, who is now um, uh, a governor of uh, Kansas, Kansas, uh, Sam Brownback was there. Um, he's our dear friend. He's a dear friend to me. I uh, able to visit him a week ago just to congratulate him in person. And he was so pleased that I traveled all the way here to go to his office and thank him on behalf of my people. And indeed, he deserved it. I presented to him the letter of invitation to come um, on the day of the independent announcement, independent of the new country. 
he was so pleased as well that he's been recognized by our president and he will be coming. Uh, it, through Charles Jacob, I also um, talked to the Congress in the Capitol Hill. Uh, through Charles Jacobs, I have able to speak to dozens of high schools and colleges and universities across the USA. Uh, all the media, uh, starting from CNN to MSNBC, Fox News, you name them, including BBC, uh, all this uh, through Charles Jacobs. So indeed, he had actually done a lot. But he's not finished there. He continued with us. He just came from Sudan actually two, three days ago. Um, I was actually at the, at the BU where he came there and presenting um, with uh, Rabbi um, Joseph, who went with him at the Boston University. It was amazing. Uh, he went for four days. He's sick. He could have been with us here, but he's sick. Uh, and I'm sure he uh, would appreciate to talk with you. But I have to describe this man because he's the reason I'm standing here. He's the man who gave me this platform, introducing me to you, continue to do so. So American is group, but one of the organizations also work partner with the CSI, which is a Christian organization called CSI, uh, stand for Christian Solidarity International based in Zurich, in Switzerland. So they have been the machine uh, making money for them to go and redeem slaves. It's something that a little controversial you can ask, but I don't know what I can tell you about it much, but it, it's something helping individuals that get liberated from the captors by paying money. So um, I'm going to end here. These are the good organization, good people that are doing good thing for good cause. You can always visit the American and Savage Group website, iabolish.org, I would abolish, and, um, and support the initiative. Um, and uh, again, I, I appreciate any help that you can give to my foundation, the francisbuckfoundation.org and to advancing education in the new country. As I said, new country is like a new baby. So it will be up to us. Um, you can't have, it's like you're having a house, and it is empty, nothing in it. You need a lot, you need furniture, you need this, you need dishes, you need everything. So we need everything. Remember that. It is absolutely a country, just a country. Ross, Republic of South Sudan, but nothing there. No building like this, not even, how many auditorium you have in this district? Many. Not even when we don't have. So think about it. Studying, we have no money. Uh, so everybody been volunteering uh, for this long, long time. But we are so happy we're gaining that freedom.